Good morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, uphill battle. 35 House Republicans broke rank and sided with all House Democrats to pass a now controversial bill creating an independent probe of the January 6th riot. The latest on what the Senate will do and what former President Trump is saying about it. Under pressure, amid growing calls from world leaders for a ceasefire in the Middle East, President Biden speaks out on a de-escalation in the crisis. We'll bring you the latest on this diplomatic test for the president and all the details from the ground. Clean team, a rare look at how one pandemic must have is made. Purell, you know it, you've probably relied on it, will take you inside their factory in Cleveland. And friends forever, more than 17 years after their final cup of coffee at Central Perk, the captivating cast of friends finally returning to the small screen, the new trailer for the highly anticipated upcoming reunion. And Joe, we are going to need a reunion of our own because you're still in L.A. <laughs> yes, I'm in L.A. today, but I'm flying back to New York and we'll see you in person, I hope, tomorrow. Great. Well, we are. Have your seat here. I was going to say keeping it warm, but no one's sitting in it, of course. So we can't wait to have you back tomorrow. Let's begin, though, on Capitol Hill. The House passed a bill yesterday that would form a bipartisan commission to investigate the January 6th insurrection. That vote came on the same day the FBI released new video of the riot. And a warning, some of the images you're about to see are disturbing. The video highlights two new suspects. One is shown allegedly ripping off a Capitol police officer's gas mask, grabbing the officer's baton, then hitting him with it. The FBI says the other suspect can be seen punching officers with metal studded gloves. More than four months after that attack, Congress is still debating how to investigate the insurrection. During yesterday's vote, 35 House Republicans did break with party leadership, voting with Democrats to pass the bill that would create an independent commission. Congressman Tim Ryan made an impassioned speech directed at lawmakers who voted no. This is a slap in the face to every rank and file cop in the United States. If we're going to take on China, if we're going to rebuild the country, if we're going to reverse climate change, we need two political parties in this country that are both living in reality, and you ain't one of them. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell joins us now. So, Leanne, first, tell us about that vote yesterday and the pressure that House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy faces for opposing the bill. Good morning, Joe. So it was a pretty stunning rebuke that 35 House Republicans still voted in support of this commission, despite leadership coming out against it and despite leadership really twisting arms to get people to oppose it. But still, the vote passed. Of course, it's going to move over to the Senate. But as far as McCarthy is concerned, he is betting that he's going to be on the right side of the former president, Donald Trump. Of course, his opposition came as uh, the former president name checked him, calling him on him to oppose this. But there's been some talk about the fact that if a commission was formed, that perhaps McCarthy himself would be subpoenaed because of his conversations with the former president. I asked McCarthy about that yesterday. Listen to what he said. What do you say to people who say that you oppose this because that you fear about being subpoenaed? Why would I be involved in any of that in any aspect? It doesn't involve. I have no concern about that, but that's somebody playing politics with it, not wanting to get to the core of what happened. And so that's McCarthy's stance, but it was a very difficult vote, especially for those 35 Republicans who left the party, So. Leanne, the big question now, can this pass in the Senate? It needs 10 Republicans and Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell told his caucus he is now against the commission. Why is he against it? And what does that mean for the odds of passing this? One day after saying he was undecided, then a Trump statement came out again, calling on McConnell to oppose it. Then the next morning, which was yesterday, he came out opposed. Listen to why he explains it. After careful consideration, I've made the decision to oppose the House Democrats' slanted and unbalanced proposal for another commission to study the events of January the 6th. What is clear is that House Democrats have handled this proposal in partisan bad faith going right back to the beginning. As you laid out, the question is, will there be the support of 10 Republicans? 
Well, it looks like a lot of Senate Republicans are following the lead of their leader, but Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has put it on the calendar. It could be voted on as early as next week, Joe. Let's see what happens. Leanne Caldwell, thanks so much. Violence between Israelis and Palestinians is raging on for an 11th day, even after President Biden called for a significant de-escalation in fighting. Overnight, Israeli warplanes unleashed a wave of airstrikes on Gaza, reducing buildings and homes to rubble. Overall, 230 Palestinians have been killed, including 65 children. Militant groups have retaliated with another wave of rocket fire toward Israel. The death toll there stands at 12. NBC News special correspondent Martin Fletcher joins us from Tel Aviv, Israel, and NBC News senior political analyst John Allen is also with us. Good morning to both of you. And Martin, I will start with you there on the ground. So there were more airstrikes on Gaza this morning. Tell us the latest. Uh, that's right, Savannah. After President Biden's call for a, a quick de-escalation, well, that didn't happen. This morning, there were very strong Israeli uh, air attacks on targets in Gaza, the same targets we've been hearing about, underground tunnels, the homes of, Isl of Islamic Jihad and Hamas leaders, which the Israelis say are legitimate military targets because they say the leaders uh, are storing weapons in their homes uh, and ammunition, all kinds of explosives. They're using their homes to, to direct the, uh, the battles in uh, information, information headquarters. So they're calling the homes of the leaders legitimate targets in this, and they're bombing those. At the same time, Hamas is firing rockets, continuing to fire rockets into Gaza. So this morning, there's been a lot of fire in both, in both directions. No significant damage on the Israeli side. But the question of whether or not Israel will stop uh, firing and whether Hamas will stop firing, this morning, um, Hamas uh, uh, officials were saying that they had agreed a mutual agreement for a ceasefire within the next day or two. So that's what we're expecting. Mm. And John, what he's hoping for, Savannah. Yeah, absolutely. John, let's bring you in here. Another phone call between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu happened. Did this conversation go any differently? And, and also just put in context here for us, how much influence does the president really have here? Savannah, I think um, what you've seen from the White House, and, and I spoke to a White House official yesterday who sort of described the evolution of their messaging. You know, it started with, with reticence uh, about this all, you know, altogether, and then there was a uh, Biden supports the ceasefire, and then yesterday uh, moved to a, a place where he was uh, essentially demanding a significant de-escalation uh, in, in, on a pathway to a ceasefire. Um, but what he hadn't done yet is actually demand ceasefire. Um, and I think what, you know, the White House has been trying to do is give uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu as much room as possible to carry out his military mission. The White House official also said to me yesterday that the White House felt that the Israeli military mission had been finished. And then we saw an IDF spokesman uh, say to Andrea Mitchell yesterday uh, that they basically wanted to show Hamas, uh, you know, what happened when you attack Israel. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the goal here for the Israelis was beyond just the military objectives of war uh, about dissuading uh, Palestinians. Uh, I think we will find out this week whether Joe Biden has influence with Benjamin that uh, and John, also, let's talk about Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She's made some controversial comments here, but now she says the U.S. should not be selling weapons to Israel, and she's planning to block a recent $735 million arms deal. Talk us through how much pressure President Biden is under from his own party to take a tougher line on Israel. I mean, it, it is a vocal group in the House uh, that would like to see that arms sale block. It is a larger group than we would have seen at any time in the last, you know, 50 years, basically. Uh, and at the same time, it is a small percentage of the Congress. So uh, the pressure on Biden is really, um, you know, whether it's really about the grassroots and whether um, he's willing to, to separate himself or keep distant from uh, the pressure he's getting to, uh, to treat this as more of a two-sided issue than it has been in Washington. Uh, over the course of the mm. years, uh, the arms sale will not be blocked in Congress. Uh, there's overwhelming support for arms sales as well. And at the same time, uh, I think there are a lot of Americans that are concerned about not only the actual uh, use of U.S.-made uh, weaponry in Israel against the Palestinians, but also the optics of that. 
Yeah. And John, also, as the situation has evolved to be something different than we've seen in years past, we also saw that the U.S. failed to back this U.N. Security Council statement calling for a ceasefire. Are there concerns here about the administration sort of being in an isolated position when you look at the international stage? I mean, if you look at the last several decades, it's not unusual for the United States to be uh, Israel's uh you know, it's Israel's most vocal and uh, influential supporter at the UN, um, and at the same time uh, be lonely in doing that. So I don't know that there's concern about it. Obviously, the United States generally likes to operate in positions where they have a coalition uh, in support of what they're doing and in support of what their allies are doing. But um, the UN is not necessarily the best forum for the Israelis, and the United States is well aware of that and, and accustomed to it. Hey, Martin, last quick question for you. Yesterday, when you were with us, you reported on protests that were going on outside of the Gaza Strip. Anything new there? Um, not, not today, but that's the main concern of Israel, is that those, uh, the rioting on the West Bank should stop. They're, they're saying that if there is a ceasefire, if and when there is a ceasefire in Gaza, then the army will immediately uh, turn its attention to the West Bank mm. to tamp down all protest. But it, that is the fear, though, that, that that could continue. And also, of course, Israeli Arabs versus Israeli Jews in Israel. But on those two fronts, for the time being, certainly today and yesterday, it's pretty quiet, Savannah. All right. Martin and John, thank you so much. Thank you. Former President Trump is lashing out after the New York Attorney General announced her office is pursuing a criminal investigation of the Trump Organization. In a statement posted to his website, Trump said in part, quote, there is nothing more corrupt than an investigation that is in desperate search of a crime. The attorney general's office is working with the Manhattan district attorney and says the criminal probe is an expansion of a civil investigation that started in 2019. NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba joins us now. So, Monica, first of all, what more are we learning about the investigation and how these offices, the AG and the DA, will be working together? Well, Joe, we're learning now this is really sort of about information sharing. And there are two new lawyers who have been detailed to work together from the New York Attorney General's office and the Manhattan DA to now collaborate on this, what was once a civil probe into the Trump organization that has now ventured into the criminal. That doesn't mean, though, that there's any kind of smoking gun necessarily or any potentially new evidence that has moved this to that. But it's the opening of a lane where there could be some potential criminality here. And that question is really the one that remains very much unanswered. And legal experts are the ones to say, we don't yet know the implications, but this is certainly not good news for the former president, who is blasting this and calling it, quote, corrupt in a more than 900 word statement. So we still don't know a lot about this, but the fact that they came out and publicly said they were going to join forces and see what more they could uncover indicates there are potential new avenues here for investigation. Again, with the word criminal being the one that raises the most eyebrows, though we don't yet know what has pushed this forward, Joe. Yeah, Monica, in that statement, the former president seemed to reference his longtime, now former attorney Michael Cohen, referring to him as a, quote, lying, discredited lowlife. We're hearing from Cohen. What's he saying about this investigation now? And their relationship really has obviously soured over the last couple of years after he was one of the former president's closest confidants. But now Michael Cohen, in an interview on MSNBC last night, had some predictions for what he thinks will happen next. Take a listen. I think Donald Trump is going to flip on all of them. What do you think about that, including his children? Huh. I think I really believe that Donald Trump is going to turn around. You always get shocked when I say things, Joy. <laughs> I really believe that Donald Trump cares for only himself. And he realizes that his goose is cooked. And of course, Michael Cohen did plead guilty to not telling the truth and has served time for that. So that's important to remember as well in all of this. But it's unclear where this goes. Of course, it's the former president's sons and namely Eric Trump, who had been put in charge of the Trump organization. And for his part, Eric Trump hasn't offered any detailed comment. The only thing we've really seen from allies of the Trump orbit is they are now trying to go after the New York Attorney General, Letitia James, who has made some comments in the past that were uh, quite critical of Donald Trump while he was in office, guys. 
Monica, the Trump organization has been under civil investigation for two years. What could this criminal probe mean for the company now? That's the million dollar question. And this is really, we should remind people, it covers a huge range. This is not just about some of the certain properties and allegations of insurance fraud or tax fraud. There's a whole litany of other things that are being considered. So as the Trump organization goes forward and tries to navigate, of course, we know the former president essentially lives at his own properties that are connected to the Trump organization. There's plenty of implications there as well, but we simply just don't know how far reaching this is. And again, we have to remind people there are a lot of parallel investigations here, and that's why the former president has so much exposure. In addition to this probe, of course, there are certain lawsuits related to his involvement in the January 6th insurrection and also in Georgia, of course, after he lost the November election. Joe. A lot to keep our eyes on. Monica Alba, thank you so much. More than one year into the coronavirus pandemic, America is slowly reopening to mixed reaction. Cases, hospitalizations and deaths are trending down nationwide as some big cities like New York lift their restrictions to match new CDC guidance. It's clear, though, that some people are more excited than others. It feels really nice to be walking around on a beautiful day with no mask. It's like, like the old days. As long as there's people around, the mask is on, I'm going to be cautious. NBC News medical reporter Erica Edwards and NBC News correspondent Megan Fitzgerald are with us to report on this new chapter in the pandemic. Good morning to both of you. Erica, first I will go to you. CDC Director Rochelle Walensky defended lifting the mask mandate during a Senate panel yesterday as she's been getting a lot of questions about this. Why now? Do we know it's safe? And how do we know that people are actually going to follow this? Why did she say that it's now up to local governments to decide what's best and how's that going to work? Yeah. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Well, first of all, it's, it's important to remember that the CDC does not issue mandates, nor does it enforce them. Uh, the CDC guidance on masking, or in this case, unmasking, is just that guidance that people who are fully vaccinated have an extremely low risk of either getting or spreading COVID-19. But that left it all up to individual states cities, even individual businesses to decide for themselves what to do with that guidance. It's a bit of a head scratcher, of course, because there's no way to prove who's vaccinated and who's not. Dr. Walensky defended those broad recommendations yesterday during a Senate hearing. Here she is. One of the things I think that's really key in this is to recognize that we're not a homogeneous country, that there are some areas, that some counties that still have less than 20 percent of people vaccinated. And so I actually think as I look at the map, a very heterogeneous map of how we're doing with cases, how we're doing with vaccinations, the, the decisions about whether, um, whether to take off a mask mandate have to be made at the local level. So the bottom line here, Savannah, is, of course, don't ditch the masks just yet, even if you are fully vaccinated. Remember that some places like airports, for example, will continue to require masks at least th for the next several months. Savannah. Erica, let's now talk about travel and some good news for Americans who are hoping to plan a European getaway this summer. I think all of us are hoping that we could do that at some point, whether it's this summer or this fall. But as far as if people feel safe or not, what, let's talk through this. What can you tell us? What are the new rules? Yeah, so yesterday, 27 ambassadors to those European Union countries all agreed to start easing restrictions on international travels, travelers like those of us here in the U.S. Now, that would mean uh, no more quarantining or uh, testing upon arrival. Now, it's, those recommendations still have to go through another formal step before they are, in fact, adopted. But I'll tell you, Savannah, European countries are really eager to get those tourists back. Mm. Uh, international travel to the area dropped, plummeted by 70% in 2020. Savannah. All right, Erica, thank you so much. In Chicago, new mask guidelines are causing confusion and controversy. Critics say city health officials are sending mixed messages with the state mirroring CDC guidelines. But Chicago's top doctor saying this. We continue to strongly advise, though not require, masking policies for all indoor settings in Chicago until COVID capacity restrictions are lifted and we are in phase five. 
For more on that, I want to bring in NBC News correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joining us from Chicago. So, Megan, all this confusion came after the CDC's guidelines changed last week. We've seen this all across the country. What's happened in Chicago since then? Well, so as you just heard from Chicago's top doctor, uh, the message here is that while they are recommending that people who are not fully vaccinated wear a mask, they are not requiring it. So it's leading to mass confusion here in the city. You see people walking into businesses, uh, bars and establishments without masks uh, until they're told that they need to put one on. So uh, there's a lot of confusion, people not understanding when they need to wear a mask, where they need to wear a mask. Uh, and so they're learning as they enter establishments, Joe. I know you spoke with some business owners who say the confusion puts a huge burden on them. Tell us more about why that is. Yeah, absolutely. So in speaking with these business owners, they tell us that they feel like they're in between a rock and a hard place because now it's up to them to try and decide whether or not people should wear masks in their establishment. Whereas before, uh, they could say, listen, you got to put the mask on because it's the CDC requirements or, you know, the state of Illinois is requiring this or the city of Chicago, uh, you know, says this. Now it's put back on them to make these decisions. Uh, and there's a lot of frustration around it. I want you to listen to what one bar owner had to say about it means I'm the police, per se. I'm the mask police. I have to police the people when they come through the door. I have to police them when they get up from their table to go to the restroom. I have to police, make sure my staff are doing it. And it's a certain level. And we're being told to ask people if, they've, if they're vaccinated. That's kind of crossing over people's privacy policy. Some people do not want to disclose it because otherwise it becomes a political conversation before you know it. Why aren't you vaccinated? Why are you vaccinated? And it kind of, it's, a, it's, kind of a, it's, a, it's a private thing for some people. Yeah, so you can certainly hear uh, the frustration uh, and uh, the situation that these these uh, owners are in. And keep in mind, you know, over the last 14 months, uh, many of these businesses suffered. You know, they had to close their doors. Uh, they had to limit capacity. So the last thing they want to do uh, is to make a customer mad and potentially lose that customer. Uh, so it's certainly a, a difficult situation that uh, owners find themselves in, Joe. Yeah, Megan, so what are some of the business owners doing now to try to strike that balance, to keep their doors open, but also try to keep their customers happy? Yeah, it's a great question. What do they do now? So a lot of folks tell us that it's all about communication. They're posting signs on their on the outside and even inside of their establishment so that people know when they come in, uh, this is what they need to do. Uh, but we're also hearing from a lot of owners that they are trying to uh, have conversation with some of their clients and customers to try and gauge uh, their level of comfort. Uh, listen to what one woman had to say. I'm going to be very adamant about asking my customers what they want, what makes them feel comfortable. I'm very uh, much on social media and into emailing um, the people that I work with and constantly, constantly bring up that conversation and seeing what makes people most comfortable. Uh, so certainly this woman has the luxury to do so because she runs an uh, event planning uh, company. Uh, but when it comes to bars and restaurants, uh, it's a little bit different. But uh, all in all, Joe, what we're seeing here is that these owners of these businesses finding themselves in a very precarious situation. Yeah, the challenge is no matter what they do, they're not going to please everyone right now. Megan, thanks so much for that report. Appreciate it. Yeah. Let's now get a check on your morning news now weather. Bill Karens is with us. Hey, Bill, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. And uh, once again, for the fourth day in a row, we're talking all about the worst weather in the country is in areas of Louisiana and Texas. Once again, it's pouring. We haven't had the epic, you know, historic flooding like the last couple of days, but it's not a pretty picture. When you see a fire hose coming off the Gulf of Mexico and these thunderstorms all in the same locations, that's when you can start to develop problems, especially since all the rivers are already in flood stage anyways in this region. And there's still a little bit of rain, too, up into Oklahoma, and some of this will push into areas of Arkansas as we go throughout the day. So our flood watches continue. Yesterday we had 28 million, so now we're down to 8 million. We've taken the Houston area and the Dallas area out of this, but still a good chunk of almost all of Louisiana and sections of Arkansas and right along the Texas-Louisiana border. It looks like the highest rainfall totals will be from Lufkin to Lake Charles, Beaumont, over towards Houston. That area could see an additional six inches of rain, so that's on top of the you know historic rainfall we've already had this week. So for today, another beautiful day on the eastern seaboard, no issues there. There, all the problems in the deep south and a little cool and chilly in the northwest. And as we head towards your weekend 
outlook. Summer warmth for the eastern seaboard and still a little bit of rain in areas of Texas and Louisiana, but it won't be the historic stuff and the you know, flooding rains that we've had the last couple days. And look at Washington, D.C., guys, on Sunday, 92 degrees. So it's going to be a very summer-like wow. feel on the eastern seaboard. My goodness. <clears throat> 90s. Summer is here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it really is. Thanks, Bill. Coming up, a controversial law restricting abortion rights in Texas. We'll explain the fetal heartbeat bill that was just signed into law next. A new abortion law in Texas is being slammed by critics as one of the most restrictive in the country. It bans abortion when a fetal heartbeat is detected, including in cases of rape or incest. There is an exception for medical emergencies. Our creator endowed us with the right to life, and yet millions of children lose their right to life every year because of abortion. In Texas, we work to save those lives. The law set to go into effect in September means abortion could be banned as early as six weeks into a pregnancy, which is before many women know that they are pregnant. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, good morning. So this law introduces new legal provisions never seen before in abortion legislation. Tell us about that. What does it do? It bans abortion, as we've just talked about, at the, at the inception of the fetal heartbeat. That can happen so early in the pregnancy that many women may not even know they are pregnant and they could have already missed the window to get an abortion, at least under this Texas law. And there are normally even exceptions for rape and incest. And you're seeing that there, Texas is even uh, very ambitiously trying to uh, do away with those as well. So this is the kind of thing that is almost certainly going to be challenged in court. And uh, given that Roe v. Wade and its progeny, the cases that have come after it, uh, seem to be directly uh, opposite to this uh, this law. It's expected mm. that at least a district court will probably strike it. Yeah, Danny. So let's talk about that. The fact that this is this nationwide abortion debate, and this is coming as the Supreme Court has announced they will hear a case on abortion rights. How does Texas's new law fit into this whole conversation going on? It seems to me that as a, an amateur observer of the Supreme Court, that there are states that want to try out some exciting new legislation that attempts to ban abortion earlier and earlier and earlier. And they probably feel like they've found the right court to do it. Maybe not Amy Coney Barrett, who you see right there, and uh, Brett Kavanaugh, but certainly with Justice Clarence Thomas, who's expressed his open hostility to the uh, to the uh, to legalized abortion. And you also have these newer conservative justices who, if it gets before the court, might ignore precedent and strike down Roe v. Wade. All right, Danny Savalos, thank you so much. Let's take a look at what's making news around the world this morning. NBC News foreign correspondent Sarah Harmon joins us from London. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Joe. Hey, Savannah. Good morning. Let's start with the very latest from Suda, where overnight dozens of migrants climbed a perimeter fence into the port area. They were hoping to sneak onto cargo ships and ferries that could take them to mainland Spain. More than 8,000 people have crossed from Morocco into Suda since Monday. Many are risking their lives swimming around a breakwater to reach the European side. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, in the Icelandic capital for talks Wednesday. He acknowledged that the two countries had differences but could still work together on major issues. Finally, guys, here in the U.K., Prince William tweeted a photo confirming he's receiving his first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, of course, here in the U.K., it goes by age group, and even a future king has to wait his turn. Guys. <laughs> That's right. All right, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Coming up, a closer look at a COVID staple keeping us all sanitized. How Purell is keeping <laughs> up with the demand of a global pandemic. That's next. The trailer is dropped for next week's long, long-awaited Friends special. Here's a look. 
everyone was so perfectly cast. Yeah. This is from the one where everyone finds out. Oh! Oh! My eyes! I know! <laughs> I remember I went to the producer of the show I was on, and he said, that show's not going to make you a star. <laughs> As you see, we see the six stars walk around the original sets at Warner Brothers Studios, take part in a trivia game, and do a table read of well-known scenes. The special also includes appearances from stars like Lady Gaga and Justin Bieber. It premieres May 27th. That's a week from today on HBO <laughs> Max. Savannah, it's hard. first there was the question, was it ever going to happen? <laughs> then it's going to happen, but it's not going to be a traditional episode. Then the pandemic delayed it. We're finally here. And now it's here. The table read is so cool to see them do that years later. Oh, I love it. And they're just all still real life friends. How cool is that? I know. They've all kept in touch. It's, yeah. it's a great idea. I think people are going to love it. So. Yeah, I can't wait. And man, Jennifer Aniston, she can stick it to them. Not going to make <laughs> her a star. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Few businesses have had a year quite like the family-owned company that makes Purell. Russ Mitchell from our affiliate WKYC takes us on an exclusive tour of the factory where they're working around the clock to keep up with demand for their must-have hand sanitizer. Good morning, Savannah and Joe. COVID made it one of the most sought after things in America, and it's produced right here in Ohio. We got an exclusive tour of the Gojo factory, which makes Purell, where we saw how the company changed to meet the skyrocketing needs of the pandemic. In this unassuming building on the outskirts of Cleveland, one of the most coveted products of the pandemic, Purell is racing down the production line. And you're seeing the filler over there, which is filling 400 bottles per minute. Just a few months before the pandemic, CEO Kerry Jarros took the reins of Gojo Industries, which makes Purell. So how would you describe the past year? Russ, I will tell you uh, that the past year has been wild. Were there days where your head was just spinning? There were plenty of days when my head was spinning. Uh, being surrounded by a team of people who were so committed to our purpose of saving lives and making life better meant that even when my head was spinning, there were a bunch of people in the room and we were all rowing in the same direction. A direction that began in 1946, right here in Ohio. Founders Goldie and Jerry Lipman wanted to develop a product that would safely clean the hands of rubber factory workers. Jerry found a scientist at Kent State to help, and Gojo Industries was born. Their great niece says the rest is history. Imagine Goldie and Jerry going into their basement at night, taking a hand crank washing machine, putting ingredients in, mixing up the product, and then putting it into pickle jars that they had claimed from restaurants in the local neighborhood. And then by day, throwing the product into the trunk and selling it, and they didn't come home until the trunk was empty. That pioneering spirit is alive and well in this third generation family-owned company. Over the course of the year, we transformed every part of our business. We produced 300 percent or three times the amount of hand sanitizer that we normally produce in a year. It's growth that is really unprecedented in our industry. You make the bottles, you fill the bottles, you sell the bottles. <laughs> What's the next step? We are committed to being surge ready for the next pandemic. I hope it never happens, but we're committed to being surge ready. A 24-7 production line and an additional 500 workers ensures they will be. Goldie and Jerry would be so proud, in particular of the hardworking team that we have. So they'd be really proud that we're continuing their legacy. And Gojo tells me even if demand drops, it is not concerned about having to cut back on employees. The company believes with the pandemic, personal hygiene habits have changed forever. And while the amped up numbers of the past year will probably level out, the company does expect business to remain at a steady high. Savannah and Joe. A black homeowner is filing a formal complaint with the Department of Housing and Urban Development after the value of her home more than doubled during a third appraisal. The difference this time? She asked her white friend to stand in for her. NBC News Now correspondent Priscilla Thompson has the story for us. Priscilla, good morning. Joe, good morning. Uh, three times did Carlette Duffy have her home appraised over the past year, and twice did that number come back lower than what she expected. So on the third try, she got creative. After her grandmother's death, Carlette Duffy set out to buy the family home by refinancing her own house. This is a photo of her behind her home with my dad. 
but after receiving two appraisals well below what she thought her home was worth, Duffy worried something might be amiss, especially after the second appraisal. It's 110,000, 15,000 less than the first one, which is less than three months earlier. So Duffy tried again. This time, she didn't disclose her race or gender, only spoke with the appraiser via email, and... I took all of these down so that they wouldn't be seen. And on the day of the appraisal, she found a stand-in. I met with two of my girlfriends. Both are married to white men, and I was like, okay, I need to borrow one of y'all husbands. <laughs> A bit skeptical at first um, until we saw the results. Duffy's home was valued at $259,000, more than double that of her previous two appraisals. I screamed with joy. I just was, I was so elated. And then it just, it quickly dissipated. Duffy's experience isn't isolated. Homes in black neighborhoods, equ homes equivalent to their white counterparts in similar social circumstances now, are underpriced by 23%, about 48,000 per home. And that adds up to 156 billion in lost equity. This month, Duffy filed a complaint with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, alleging discrimination in both her appraisal and lending process. You are taking away my family's ability to create generational wealth. In statements to NBC News, citywide home loans denied any discrimination and said they are actively participating in the HUD investigation. Freedom Mortgage said they used an automated valuation model after receiving the complaint and stood by the appraised value. None of the appraisers named in the complaint responded to NBC's request for comment. As for Duffy, she used the money from the final appraisal to fulfill that dream. That's the house that my grandfather built. I hope to see my grandbaby raised in that house. Joe, experts tell me that black homeowners should assume that they are being discriminated against in this process and make sure that they look over those appraisals very carefully. Now, if they do suspect something, maybe uh, an issue may be at play there, they can challenge that appraisal with their lender. And if they feel they need to take additional steps, reach out to their local fair housing organization or an attorney. Joe. Good advice, Priscilla. Thank you so much. Coming up, a bus stop kidnapping attempt caught on tape in Florida. Yeah, the unexpected clue that police say led them right to the suspect up next. Fascinating new developments in a disturbing kidnapping attempt caught on tape. Police have arrested and charged the man they say was trying to snatch an 11-year-old girl while she waited for her school bus. NBC News correspondent Carrie Sanders spoke with the victim and her mother. Hi, Carrie. Good morning. What'd you learn? Well, good morning for 11-year-old Alyssa. What started out as a normal day at the bus stop quickly turned into a nightmare because, as you noted, someone tried to grab her. But thanks to her incredible gumption and quick thinking because of a toy that she had in her hand, a suspect was easily identified. Just hours after this disturbing kidnap attempt unfolded in Florida, deputies were able to find the man they say is responsible, all thanks to an unexpected clue. I was able to get the time on to his upper arm and I think a little bit on his door. 11-year-old Alyssa told me she was mixing blue paint into some homemade slime Tuesday morning while waiting for the school bus to arrive. Shortly after, this shocking surveillance video released by authorities shows a white vehicle driving up to a nearby corner. A man suddenly jumps out and starts to charge Alyssa. The man um, got out of his vehicle, holding the knife, came towards me and um, I tried to run, but he caught me. As Alyssa turns to run, the attacker grabs her and tries to drag her back towards the car. But she fought back, and both fell to the ground. The man quickly flees back to the SUV and speeds away. Authorities say that man is 30-year-old Jared Paul Stanga, now charged with attempted kidnapping of a child under 13, along with aggravated assault and battery. He's being held on just over $1.5 million bond. Alyssa says she knew to get the blue slime on her attacker because of one of her favorite shows she watches with her mom. 
a little show called Law and Order SVU. But I knew that that might be better evidence for if the cops do find them. Turns out she was right. The victim at the time of the attempted abduction was playing with blue slime. The suspect, when we caught him, had blue slime all over his own arms. Authorities praising Alyssa for her incredible bravery. I'm not so sure if she actually comprehends exactly what could have happened. And she fought like a trooper. How do you feel to be an example of how to fight back and not give in? What would Detective Olivia Benson say about you for such a good job? Probably you're brave and good job. Definitely. She is brave and what a great job. And Carrie, also, I can't believe I'm going to ask you this, but from your reporting here, it appears this wasn't the first experience like this that Alyssa had reported recently. Yeah, I know. It was two weeks ago that she says she thought she saw the same car with the same driver (sighs) come up and try to talk to her. As a good junior detective, she reported that to her mom, Amber, as well as to the school principal. And of course, now, as we've seen, she is doing so well. And interestingly, her mother says she's in counseling, but she believes that her 11 year old is still the resourceful little girl that she's always been after this. Oh, my goodness. Carrie, you know how they do those cameos in SVU. I see one in her future. She deserves it. (laughs) Thanks, Carrie. Agreed. (laughs) When the pandemic hit, life changed, and it changed quickly, especially for schools. Kids had to adjust to online learning, but some struggled to get their hands on the right technology. Well, now as many schools prepare for in-person classes this fall, they're trying to make the transition back a little easier. As he travels across America this week, NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt stopped in Cleveland to see how one school is hoping to re-engage students. Savannah and Joe, here in Cleveland, COVID left school kids disadvantaged in so many ways, but there's a major effort underway here to make up for lost time. At the Orchard School in Cleveland, Principal Katherine Hanlon is happy to finally have students back in person. There are just things that happen when you're face to face with a teacher that cares about you. But she sees the learning loss that comes from more than a year of trying to teach kids remotely. And I think particularly our youngest children really struggled. The pandemic hit Cleveland schools hard. The district serves more than 34,000 students, many from disadvantaged neighborhoods, the highest child poverty rate in the nation, and one of the worst wired cities in the country. A lot of kids simply simply didn't have the computers or Wi-Fi. No devices, no Wi-Fi other than maybe their cell phone. We had teachers literally teaching on um, Facebook and Instagram to stay in touch with their kids. Over that summer, we deployed 37,000 devices, thousands and thousands of hotspots, and then our teachers and our kids had to learn how to use all this technology. And we would say, you know, put the at symbol in, and they didn't know what that was. Cleveland School CEO Eric Gordon hopes to give students what was taken from them. We didn't lose the ability to learn. Uh, kids can still learn to read. They can still learn chemistry. They lost time. To make up that lost time, Cleveland is looking to summer, and they're not alone. More than 47 percent of urban school districts are planning enhanced summer learning plans this year, since they can't legally require all kids to attend summer classes. After a challenging year, Cleveland kids and families deserve something great. Cleveland has launched an unprecedented ad campaign, even including roadside billboards, all part of a nearly $20 million plan for what they call the summer learning experience, part school, part camp. We're just flipping the total traditional classroom up on its head. Reinventing summer learning and making kids want to be there. Classes like Mars Rover Challenge, coding, art classes, even journalism. I notice you're not using the term summer school. No, we are not going to summer school. There's a stigma associated with summer school, that that term? There's a huge stigma, particularly in urban communities, that summer school is for the kids that are behind. This is supposed to be something that's fun and exciting and enthusiastic for everyone to learn from. And Cleveland schools are partnering with community groups to create experiences outside the classroom. Like the Cleveland Playhouse, where students have theater and music classes taught by Playhouse staff. What's the thing you're looking forward to most in the summer program? Science. Science, really? What do you want to be? 
I want to be a scientist. Art teacher David Hoydick hopes this summer will help him reconnect with students on a more personal level. I think it'll make a big difference. The more we can have contact time with the kids, the more that we can teach and the more that they can learn. How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back engaged and back where we would want them to be? It would be a mistake for us to think that we are going to take a year of the most severe disruption in all of our lives and fix that in a summer or even in a year. But, um, you know, if we stay really uh, aggressive about creating the right opportunities, we will get kids where they need to be. Coming up, a theater program that's helping its performers sing off stage just as well as they do on stage. It's giving thespians on the autism spectrum a chance to find their voice. That story next. This morning, we want to bring you an uplifting story about the nonprofit group Action Play that's giving kids and adults a life changing chance to take the stage. The leader bringing light in this story is the group's founder, Aaron Feinstein. For people on the autism spectrum and with related conditions, he's not just creating an outlet for art. He's creating real opportunities to perform professionally. If your head's about to explode, I can fix it. A performance isn't just defined by what happens on stage. Let's go entertain them. Yeah! For the kids and adults of action play, the impact is felt off stage. Just ask Eddie, Sandy, and Patrick. It's made me more outgoing and it taught me how to socialize with people. That this doesn't come naturally to me to socialize. Definitely improved my social skills and I have a lot more friends. It's my social spot and also my happy place. Patrick was 12 years old when he first got involved with Action Play, a group that gives kids and adults on the autism spectrum access to the arts. I can just turn into this whole new character with just a snap of a finger, and it's amazing because I can feel all these new emotions. It sounds like it's changed your life. Quite a lot, actually. Yeah, it made me, it's made me so much happier during you know, these times, especially. Action Play's founder and executive director, Aaron Feinstein, can relate. I was a bit of an outcast. I was a bit bullied. Um, I had learning disabilities myself, and the theater really became like a safe place for me. That's why he created Action Play. They put on musicals and have a chorus singing their own original music. When you see the performances, when you're watching them on stage, what goes through your mind? I mean, it's, it's magic. I can't think of anything that makes me more proud into when the lights go up and I see everyone on, on stage and I'm watching an audience just like have their minds blown too. They've shared the stage with Weird Al Yankovic and Tony winner Cynthia Erivo. Over the past year, they've been meeting on a virtual stage, but that didn't stop a surprise guest hey, from dropping play. in. It's Mikey Day from Saturday Night Live and I'm sorry to interrupt your rehearsal, but I just wanted to say congratulations on the awesome work you guys are doing. Awesome. Oh, it was amazing. Hoping to make more dreams come true, Action Play is working with Hollywood's casting industry, a partnership that helps some of their performers find professional work, including a part on Law & Order SVU and a role in a dramatic comedy at the Tribeca Film Festival. It also teaches casting agents about working with neurodiverse actors. The fact that there's so many talented people with disabilities that just are not getting opportunities, and the fact that we can work within the industry and help to transform that is also really exciting. Recently, the movie Music, which told the story of an autistic teenager, faced major backlash for not giving the role to an autistic actor. While shows like Atypical and Everything's Gonna Be Okay have been praised for casting actors who are on the autism spectrum. And I believe that there should be a wide array of artists and creators writing about what they know, creating what they know, representing their own experiences. Sandy agrees. I, she dreams of being on Broadway, David. while Patrick hopes to someday conduct an orchestra. They're grateful to Action Play and to Aaron for helping their wishes take flight. He's very accepting of ideas for shows, music. It wouldn't be the same without him. 
What were you thinking when you were listening to them talk about how much this meant to them? I got very emotional just because to hear the impact that this program had on their lives, you know, the fact that this is really where they feel safe. This is the place where they make their friends. A cast of friends on stage. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.